Welcome to the video on War Photographer from the Power and Conflict Anthology. If you can grab your anthology or a copy of the poem and we will begin. Okay, if you can turn to page 41 and we will read along. War Photographer by Carol Ann Duffy. In his dark room, he is finally alone with spools of suffering set out in ordered rows. The only light is red and softly glows as though this were a church and he a priest preparing to intone a mass. Belfast, Beirut, Fenham Pen, all flesh is grass. He has a job to do. Solutions slop in trays beneath his hands, which did not tremble then, though seem to now. Rural England, home again to ordinary pain which simple weather can dispel, to fields which don't explode beneath the feet of running children in a nightmare heat. Something is happening. A stranger's features faintly start to twist before his eyes, a half-formed ghost. He remembers the cries of this man's wife, how he sought approval without words to do what someone must, and how the blood stained into foreign dust. A hundred agonies in black and white from which his editor will pick out five or six for Sunday's supplement. The reader's eyeballs prick with tears between the bath and pre-lunch beers. From the aeroplane he stares, impassively at where he earns his living, and they do not care. Now, before we look at the poem uh, stanza by stanza, let's have a look at some context. So this is about um, Caroline Duffy and her inspiration for this particular poem. Um, Caroline Duffy was our Poet Laureate up until 2019, so she spanned from 2009 to 2019 as Poet Laureate, which is the prestigious um, position of being the poet in charge of writing about our country. Now, this particular poem um, was written before she was Poet Laureate. It was written in 1985. Caroline Duffy was very good friends with a man called Don McCullin. Now, he's the man pictured in the middle picture on the right hand side. Um, Don McCullin was a very famous war photographer, has photographed um, war zones around the world, including Vietnam, which is an inspiration um, for this poem as well as um, Northern Ireland, um, which is where Belfast is, which is also mentioned in this poem. Uh, this poem was written as part of a collection that she um, released and had published in 1985. Duffy recognised um, that war photographers have a duty to capture the very worst of humanity. Um, however, they're not allowed to get personally involved in the conflict. They're just documenting it um, uh, for history and in their own way, making a difference to build awareness in the public of what's really going on down on the ground. In this poem, she explores the kind of detachment emotionally that the war photographer has at the time of taking the photos. Um, it's a job, it's his duty, so he's very calm in the moment. However, it's juxtaposed with the emotions and the kind of anger um, that the war photographer feels when he's back home in the relative safety of his dark room watching these photos come back to life and remembering and reliving those experiences and how that kind of haunts him um, when he's back in relative safety. Now perhaps Duffy recognised in herself as a poet the desire to make people see truth and certainly through this poem she's doing that. Um, through photographs and poems we can really confront reality um, rather than shield ourselves from the truth. So both war photographers and poets um, make us examine ourselves and how we feel by showing us the truth about the world in which we live. So there is a kind of affinity between the two. 
OK, so let's start by looking at stanza one and the title. So the title is War Photographer. That's singular. Um, so it tells us that it's an individual and it also tells us their job title and therefore their role in society, setting us up for that perspective in the poem. So then on line one, we have in his dark room, he is finally alone. So first of all, we know it's about a male war photographer. Um, it's also in the third person. So instead of giving us it from his own experience, we're watching almost as an omniscient um, narrator here. Um, watching what's going on um, from outside, much like he watches who he takes photos um, of from from kind of a detached space. Um, it's also possessive, so it's his dark room, which tells us that he's in his own space, um, where you would imagine he feels most comfortable. Also, in that first line, we have that he is finally alone. Now, the finally tells us that he hasn't been alone for a very long time, which also suggests that he's been surrounded by people um, for a prolonged amount of time. Line two, we have with spools of suffering set out in ordered rows. So that sibilance there with the spools of suffering um, could reflect perhaps the whispers of the dead. Now I've put some pictures on the right hand side of the screen for you. So this is what film looked like. So a spool is something that's um, around um, a pin. So you usually talk about spools of thread. Um, so they're circular and they're wrapped around. And this is from the film in um, the cameras that he would have used and then the spool unravels so spools of suffering is about the films that are um, stuck out on the desk in ordered rows um, so the sibilance could reflect the whispers of the dead the ordered rows you could say therefore um, represent a form of kind of remembrance like gravestones he's laying them out in ordered rows as if graves would be laid out um, in a graveyard then in line three we have the only light is red and softly glows. Now this is this bottom picture. In a dark room you need um, when developing photos not to have any white light because that can affect and destroy the film. So when developing photos you use a red light. Um, now we know as well as that literal reference to the red light the colour symbolism red can signify blood, anger and death. So you have this literal need for that colour, but also you can't help but be surrounded by that symbolism of death um, and suffering as you're developing these films. This is then contrasted with that nice softly glows. So it's not too stark, it's not too harsh um, and actually some form of comfort to him. Then we have this nice simile, as though this were a church and he a priest preparing to intone a mass. That's obviously a simile because of the as. So here he's comparing his dark room to being a church and he is a priest here, um, intoning a mass, giving a sermon. So here it tells us that he associates himself with being quite godlike or associated with doing God's work, which tells us that he's doing something important um, and he sees himself as teaching people and leading them to the right thing. Um, you could say that there's a certain amount of ego, but more so um, he feels he has a role in society and this is his duty. Then the final line in this stanza, we have Belfast, Beirut, Fen and Pen, all flesh is grass. Now the Belfast, Beirut, Fen and Pen minor sentences also have that b and p sound in them, those plosives. And those that coupled with those short sentences make it sound like um, gunfire almost. These are all war zones. So Belfast is Northern Ireland and um, Beirut. Um, Fen and Pen, very famous war zones in this period of time, um, so that he would have been sent to. Um, so this b b p p noise uh, represents the gunfire and the bombing. 
of those places. And then we finish this stanza with this quite shocking metaphor, all flesh is grass. Um, and here we could be saying, OK, more than one thing. So certainly bodies go into the ground, um, are buried or um, cremated and then sprinkled or whatever, or left to rot into the ground. And therefore your flesh turns into the grass and provides nutrients for the soil. So you could be talking about the cycle of life um, and how um, that happens. Or you could be saying all flesh is grass, that people are being walked all over. OK, that their bodies are laid on the ground and then they are just walked all over. So it could be a negative thing to here. So here in stanza two, we start off with this nice, simple sentence, which almost sounds like a command from um, him to himself. He has a job to do. Um, it's the simple sentence as well makes it really effective. It brings us back into the moment and into the present because he's been reminiscing. It's almost like he's bringing himself back around and to stop procrastinating and, and kind of getting back into the emotions of things and back into the moment. And um, then we have solutions slop in trays beneath his hands. So that sibilance of solutions slop and also the word slop is quite onomatopoeic. It's mimicking the sound of that movement of the liquid that helps the um, photos to develop as seen in the photo at the top of the screen. So it's that mimicking that sound of that sloshing, helping us to feel as if we are there with him, watching him um, develop these photos. And then we're told that his hands did not tremble then, though seem to now. So there's a sense of irony here almost in that his hands were steady in the moment at the peak of action when he was there witnessing firsthand this terrible event that he's taken the photo of. His hands were steady then in the moment. It almost gives us a sense of kind of pride for him that he's managed to overcome in that moment. And yet now when he's home in relative safety developing these photos, his hands are shaking. He can't control his emotions now, whereas he could when he was there despite the fact that he's home and safe, which is reminded um, by this next nice, simple sentence, rural England, which again brings us back out of the moment and into the present and where we are now. We are in rural England. So it's not even urban England where there's a lot of noise going on. It's nice, peaceful, tranquil, rural England, the countryside, where none of these things should be threatening him and yet he still begins to shake. This could be, obviously we know from our other studies of other poems, a form of PTSD which links in with Remains, the poem Remains, um, where the soldier has PTSD and struggles to cope with his emotions um, following an incident. So it's odd here that in the moment he's fine and yet his body is reacting differently when he's home in relatively safe um, places. So this is then supported by home again to ordinary pain, which simple weather can dispel. So ordinary pain almost trivialises here with this with this phrase. It's almost an oxymoron because something cannot be ordinary and calm and peaceful and normal and yet be pain, which is suffering and injury and, well, pain. So putting those two things together almost trivialises his pain now. This is just emotional pain for him. He can deal with that. It's just ordinary pain. It's trivialising his symptoms because he's seen so much worse in others. Simple weather can dispel it. So just a little bit of sunshine can make him feel better or a little bit of rain can make it go away. And then we have to fields which don't explode beneath the feet of running children in a nightmare heat. So he's staying here in rural England, the fields here don't contain 
explosives. They don't contain children running in nightmare heat. Now, this is a reference to Vietnam specifically and the use of napalm against the Vietnamese. We have a picture of napalm at the bottom. Um, so the aircraft will strike down and it decimates the ground below. You also have in the bottom right hand corner a very famous photo taken in Vietnam of children running away, um, having to be stripping off, um, horrible screaming. It was a very, very effective photo that shocked people back home about what was really going on. Now here he's saying the fields don't do this. He's trivialising I should be safe. These fields are fine, but by saying what it doesn't show, it reminds us that he is still haunted by these images of children running, of nightmarish heat, fields exploding. And he is traumatised and reliving the memory of those things. OK, so stanza three. Again, at the beginning of the stanza, we're brought back to the present. Something is happening. So he snaps again out of his kind of reverie, out of his remembering of those horrible traumatic events and is brought back to the present in the moment of his development of these photos. So again, a nice simple sentence to trigger that removal of the flashback, the reminiscence into the present um, tense again. A stranger's features faintly start to twist before his eyes. Now, twisting features here is suggestive of pain. If your features are twisted, you're in agony. But in reality here, it's actually the photo starting to develop and the features are starting to come out in the development of the photo. As you can see in the top right, that's how they start to slowly um, come alive. Then it's described as a half formed ghost and that's because as you can see in the picture as they start to develop it gets clearer and clearer and it's about that in between stage between life and death being a ghost but also the negatives developing obviously the use of ghost here is meant to remind us of death okay and it's suggesting that the person the photo is taken of is in that in between between life and death is also almost a ghost and um, so it's a really crisp clear image here that's meant to link to both of those things then we have he remembers the cries of this man's wife so this is the sound of her pain it's echoing in his ears he's recalling that noise again putting him into this kind of visceral auditory feeling where he can recollect it so clearly even the sound of the wife crying um, it's much like in London when uh, William Blake hears the cries of children. It's all about pain. It's something that's hard to bear. Um, then how he sought approval without words to do what someone must. So here he is looking at the wife and seeking her approval. Here he's asking permission to take the photo. The must here as well, what someone must, gives us a sense of obligation. He feels it is his job, his obligation to document, but he also seeks her permission. There's a sense of empathy here. He has empathy for her and yet he can't get involved. He has to remain certainly detached. But this eye contact, this seeking of approval does show some form of care here. And then finally, and how the blood stained into foreign dust. Um, the staining here shows that it leaves a mark, that this death has left a mark in the form of the photo, but also a mark on the ground, on the earth, linking back earlier to all flesh is grass. That blood is sinking into the ground and the cycle of life continues. You can make a link there, obviously, with remains when you have the blood shadow. Um, on the street that he walks over week after week. Here again, it's about sustaining this life has made an imprint on the earth, on nature. Um, 
and that is permanent. OK, and that brings us to the final stanza, stanza four. So we have at the start of this stanza, a hundred agonies in black and white. Now, in this stanza, he does not snap straight back out again. He's um, getting angrier. So the tone is is a lot more angry, is a lot more emotionally charged in this stanza. So we've got possible hyperbole, possibly not, certainly excess, a hundred agonies. And agony is extreme pain. This is all about excess about volume of death, about the excessive pain of the death. It is about extremity. They're also in black and white. Now we could interpret that as black and white coloured photos. Also, newspapers are generally printed in black and white. And there is the phrase, if it's in black and white, then it is fact. It is truth. It is certified. Um, if something is in black and white, it's simple, it's clear, it's factual. So you can interpret that phrase black and white here um, in it. It's kind of ambiguous about what it means. Is it about the colour of the photos? Is it about the fact that they are definitely factually dead? He has recorded this pain and suffering and there is so much of it. Then from which his editor will pick out five or six for Sunday's supplement. This just is shocking. Out of the hundred hundreds of pain that he's documented, only five or six make the cut. So many are going to waste and that shows us his kind of anger and pain that he's documented all these deaths, all this suffering, and yet only five or six get selected by an editor of the paper that gets to choose whose suffering is best. Um, and there's a sense of kind of vulgarity about it here. Um, also, Sunday supplement is the, if you've ever done a paper round, you'll know all about why Sundays are the worst days. Because on a Sunday, in the Sunday papers, you get these magazines, these extra supplementary pieces that's shoved in the middle. Um, so the Sunday supplement is the bonus magazine that people like to pour over on a Sunday when they're resting. So, again, it's not headline, frontline news. It's something that's supplementary, that's a bonus that's been added into the paper. So it's almost angry here that this isn't, this isn't headline news. All this suffering is, is almost trivialised. A lot of people just throw away the inserts from the Sunday papers. Um, so, again, it's about not being taken seriously, not being um, concerned about. And this is then emphasised with the next line. The reader's eyeballs prick with tears between the bath and pre-lunch beers. If their eyeballs are pricking with tears, that means that they're welling up a little bit, but there's no actual suffering, no actual pain, no, no real empathy from the readers here. Um, they're also just reading it in between their bath and their beer. Um, it doesn't prevent them from getting on with their Sunday. It means that they're going about their casual day and it makes no real difference to the readers and that must be incredibly frustrating um, for the wall photographer who sees his job as so important and actually not particularly successful. And that leads us to this last final lines um, here where that really is quite hammered home. From the aeroplane he stares impassively at where he earns his living and they do not care. Now, there's a sense of irony here. The word impassively means without emotion. So it suggests that as he's looking out of the aeroplane at the war zone, he is without emotion at what he sees. There is a sense of detachment again. He's gone back into his role. And again, he's managed to shut down his emotions in order to be able to deal with what's coming. So the irony comes here with this last la part of the line, they do not care. He's angry here at people not caring enough. People like the editors of the magazine, the readers of the magazine, potentially governments or the government in which of the country he's entering. But the irony comes from his anger at them for not caring. And yet 
he is impassive himself. He is entering this war zone and having to switch off his emotions. He is not caring. And that's obviously juxtaposed because we know that actually he does care. We know he cares because he made eye contact with the wife. We know he cares because he takes his job seriously and has been taking the photos in the earlier um, and developing them. Also earlier when he described himself as a priest preparing to intone a mass. So he does care. So the irony is odd and we understand it, but we also understand that it, we need to make a difference and the readers should be caring, which is the point in this last stanza. So this brings us to the end. What you'll need to make sure you've done now is you've completed your annotations and made some notes um, and then complete an amity for this poem. So you need to know what it's about, how the mood is through the poem and if it changes, any ideas and themes that are apparent in this poem that the poet wants us to take away. Finally, your T is your three techniques, so make sure you pick out your favourite three and the quotations and what they tell us. And then finally, you need to write your own response. What have you felt um, having read this poem? How did it make you feel? Did it Was it successful in meeting the poet's intentions? Um, once you've collated all that information, you are ready to go with your revision. All we need to do now is talk about which other poems from the anthology this particular poem can be linked to when you get to assessment. So, Remains. Um, Remains is probably the strongest connection here on most levels um, because they're both poems deal with a level of PTSD, um, which we know is post-traumatic stress disorder, the impact of war on an individual. Um, and that kind of reminder of the memory recounting um, and recalling of a stressful event and affecting their current um, anxiety and uh, life. Uh, you've also got anger in both poems um, aimed at different um, things. The reality of war is apparent in both poems. They're both um, also about memory and also guilt as well appear in both bayonet charge and um, you can make links with bayonet charge on the impact of war on an individual and um, again anger in both poems um, are shown um, but from different perspectives because obviously in bayonet charge as well is also told in the third person but is about a soldier rather than the war photographer and um, also reality of war and the impact of war uh, kamikaze has the impact of war on an individual, the pilot, um, but also deals with memory as well and in a different way. His memories are more positive, um, guilt certainly and suffering, but that's of the family as a result of their treatment by him and his not participating. Um, poppies, you can link again to memory and memory and recalling events, although this time in a more positive way, her memories are more positive than her present. Uh, the impact of war as well on an individual, but this occasion on a female mother. Then London, it's not ever so um, easy to connect to London, but if London is your favourite, both poems attack others are placing blame um, on other people and their anger is um, kind of positioned at authority figures who are not doing enough about preventing these things and um, also wanting to make a difference to ease suffering and um, so it's all about the power of humanity in London obviously we hear the cries much like he hears the cries in Wolf Photographer and um, they both poets think um, or both narrators think it is not enough. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Thank you for listening.